Good afternoon, everyone. We are glad to welcome you on our webinar dedicated to cybersecurity. Today, you will discover the most frequent cyber threats and best practices to ward them off with real life examples and case studies from the fintech, manufacturing, and energy industries. And before we start, I would like to take five minutes to share some organizational points and quick introduction of InfoPulse. My name is Victoria Zemenko, and I will be the host of our today's event. Our webinar will last one hour, and our speakers are uh, Dmitro Siras, Security Portfolio Manager at InfoPulse, and Kostantin Losinski, Security Expert at InfoPulse. Please note that all participants are in mute mode, but we welcome your questions. Please use the Q&A section. Our speakers will be happy to answer the questions during the Q&A session at the end of our webinar. This webinar is being recorded and we will definitely share the recordings and presentation materials most likely during a week. If you have any additional questions after the event, uh, please feel free to write us and we'll definitely redirect questions to our speakers. And of course, you will get the answers. For those attending our webinars for the first time, I would like to tell you a little about InfoPulse. InfoPulse is a part of the leading Nordic digital services company, Tieta Avery. And it is international provider of IT services to small, medium enterprise and Fortune 100 companies. Founded in 1991, InfoPulse has a team of over 2,300 professionals, and it is represented in seven countries across the globe. On the next slide, you can see InfoPulse recognitions and certifications. We are one of the top 100 outsourcing companies in the world, according to the international organization IAOP, for six years in a row, and are also a certified gold partner of Microsoft. On the next slide, you can see some of our clients we are happy to work with. Uh, we provide them with various technology services from the next slide including cybersecurity. So that's all from my side. Thank you very much for your attention. I'm ready to pass the floor to the first speaker, Dmitro Siras. Dima, please welcome. Thank you, Victoria. <clears throat> Let's start. So uh, in the era before the cloud, uh, common uh, IT environment of uh, most companies looks like uh, on, on current slide. So depending on number of uh, physical locations or data, data centers, uh, companies usually uh, get uh, some um, local network, which was used to, to host uh, servers, users, uh, and other assets of corporate uh, IT environment. And usually this network was uh, <clears throat> protected against uh, exter external uh, internet, external networks with help, with help and or with use of, of firewalls. If company uh, got multiple locations, uh, their networks uh, was uh, were isolated uh, in the same way, so each network uh, was protected by firewalls, and interconnectivity between these networks uh, was uh, organized and protected with firewalls also. Additionally to that, uh, some corporate assets, uh, mobile devices, usually mobile devices, they uh, were connecting to a corporate network uh, using uh remote uh, access technologies uh, which is most common uh, was named as vpn so vpn allowed uh, such users to connect to to firewall or vpn gateway and get access uh, to internal network uh, and get access to some internal resources afterwards however um after uh cloud, cloud came to our uh, life everything changed a, a bit uh, everything started from uh, such uh, SaaS services uh, as uh, Office 365, as uh, Google Suite and others, which uh, allowed users uh, to collaborate, to get access to part of co corporate resources, to corporate data uh, using cloud technologies. And uh, that was challenging uh, at the time. Uh, however, it, it was uh, just beginning. After that, uh, such uh, approach as uh, Bring Your Device uh, became popular, and uh, this uh, meant that a uh, user uh, could get access to corporate resources from their personal devices from outside of the 
company and was important important such as uh, such sets such uh, personal devices they were not usually they were not managed by uh, corporate assets <clears throat> so this means that uh, additionally to those security perimeter that was before uh, and uh, which was controlled by firewall we've got some additional components that were uh, located out of corporate uh, perimeter after out of corporate uh, environment after that, uh, lots of additional uh, components uh, came to uh, to organization, came to reality, and uh, we've got lots of uh, uh, such uh, things as IoT uh, devices like uh, co controllers, like uh, different uh, web cameras uh, and uh, other solutions. Uh, uh, got them as a part of corporate environment. We've got lots of uh, platform as a service or infrastructure as a service uh, components. This were located in, in clouds. And uh, after uh, every all these changes, uh, in, as a result, security perimeter became as outlined on current slide. So it, it was uh, <coughs> now uh, it consists of uh, internal resources and lots, lots of other cloud components that are part of corporate environment. Uh, additionally to that, uh, we cannot say anymore that uh, corporate uh, peri security perimeter is limited with uh, corporate network and internal assets only because all of these uh, components uh, mentioned uh, before, they are a native part of uh, corporate environment, IT environment, and they should be protected accordingly. This means that uh, security perimeter, modern security perimeter, it's mostly depends on security of uh, identity, of user identity, of their credentials, then on uh, on premise security on pre of on premise components and etc. Um, because if someone breach user uh, user identity, user credentials, they might get access to corporate data, corporate uh, sensitive assets, even if they do not have any connectivity to corporate network. Um, that's why current security perimeter uh, can be uh, outlined uh, or can be uh, limited with such uh, solutions as uh, firewall for sure, because network connectivity is still uh, available. Uh, it's uh, VPN concentrators that uh, still are uh, relevant for, uh, for most companies. Uh, it's uh, web applications or other applications that are uh, exposed to outsides, exposed to internet, but are located uh, in DMZ or are located in um, in cloud uh, cloud environment. And also what, what is the most important from our perspective is uh, user identity, which should be protected uh, precisely, precisely and it should uh, be uh, controlled uh, as with as much care as possible. On the next slide, uh, my colleague Constantine, he, he will tell a couple of cases that are relevant uh, for uh, security and uh, perimeter security. So please welcome, Constantine. Yeah, thanks Dima for a great introduction and speech about what is modern perimeter, how it is organized and what purposes does it fit in the uh, today's companies and I will talk about um, a few cases that we faced with regarding how companies failed to protect their perimeter just to show you uh, in a more efficient manner how to more efficiently protect uh, the corporate perimeter. Uh, the first case I would like to tell is uh, happened with one of our uh, clients, the banking company. So uh, they purchased a project. Uh, it was a pen testing project which included a perimeter assessment. Uh, so what did we found on their perimeter? Uh, it was a banking application, uh, the one that client uh, used to interact with the company and the test version of the same banking application uh, and a web interface to administrative access. Um, we tried to brute force uh, access to those systems and uh, after a few attempts, we were able to successfully gain access to the admi 
administrative access to the banking application and um, access to test environment. Uh, what interesting we found there. Um, those two parts were not closed by any security solutions, uh, by any WAF. They had lowered um, security restrictions and so on. So we uh, could search for the vulnerabilities without any problems. Yeah. And the same vulnerabilities uh, typically appear in the production environment also. Uh, you just have to bypass uh, the web application firewall if it is there. Um, so what was the potential impact uh, from those findings to our client? Uh, first of all, um, it was an easy way to disclose the vulnerabilities of the production environment because testing environment is typically absolutely the same as production, but with lowered uh, security um, solutions and requirements and policies. Uh, also, we could examine the business logic of uh, the application itself, so to understand how um, all those algorithms of uh, anti-fraud works, just to bypass them in uh, the production environment. And um, together, uh, these vulnerabilities uh, could allow us to steal some money uh, to make unauthorized um, transfers, uh, to inject code and so on. So what were the violations that client um, made uh, with his um, perimeter? First of all is a firewall misconfiguration. Uh, why? Because those two sites, the test environment and the admin side of the test environment, uh, they had to be exposed only to for a few days, just for testing. Uh, yeah, and then they had to be closed uh, behind the firewall and VPN access, but someone forgot uh, to do that. So the configuration was broken because the company expected firewall to be configured in one way, and actually it was configured absolutely another way. Um, the second um, violation that company um, done during the configuration was um, weak password policy for test environment. Uh, as we all know, uh, test environment should be protected the same way as pro uh, production environment because test environment always is like easy path to obtain the production. So passwords also have to be strong. Uh, they shouldn't be guessable in a few attempts, just knowing some information about the company. Um, and of course, um, the, the business logic of the application also have to be uh, configured the right way. But of course, we obtained access to admin access uh, to admin uh, portal, so we just could see all the algorithms of the business logic. So nothing can stop us doing that uh, in this scenario. So what are the countermeasures uh, that should be uh, considered by the client and for uh, by those who suffer the same problems or vulnerabilities. First of all, uh, you need to have the change management uh, procedure uh, because if the proper change management proce procedure would be in place, a uh, client, um, even if he makes uh, vulnerable configuration changes like this one, um, someone will look uh, to confirm those configuration changes and see that uh, it makes the whole, whole company at risk and it shouldn't be done. And even, it, even if it is temporary, the proper change management pr process will notify the responsible people that this uh, change have to be reverted in one or two days if it is needed. Uh, then the password policy enforcement should be done also in the test environment, not only in the production system. And of course, uh, regular pen tests or uh, assessments, because if pen test project would be run uh, earlier, because between the vulnerable configuration change and our project uh, passed something like more than half of the year, uh, 
all this time the systems were uh, vulnerable to the attackers so the regular pen tests or uh, assessment would uh, definitely disclose those problems vulnerabilities and give the client the proper recommendations how to close them now moving on to another uh, case which is about oil and gas company uh, it's the second case when um, client also had uh, a pen testing project um, we had negotiated all the access points uh, the scope of the project but this uh, scope of the project was not fully negotiated for the perimeter assessment so we made a small OSINT just to understand uh, whether client gave us all his locations and as, as a result we understood that that client gave us only the main offices uh, and the data centers so only those networks uh, but client omitted the um, their smaller locations the guest stations by themselves so we started uh, looking at them uh, more precisely just from typical regular uh, vulnerability scan and we identified the problem uh, or not the problem first of all we identified a few services that were publicly available um, some of them um, were not interesting at all uh, they were just uh, like static web pages uh, and other one it was pretty interesting because we didn't see any um, of the systems like that uh, we couldn't identify any information with uh, with the same uh, name so we tried to bridge that and uh, we tried to bridge the passwords and from the tens attempt uh, we could get inside and what did we identify there um, it was a system to control the levels of the fuel um, on the company's gas stations um, I heard that it's not a single uh, company who fa faced with that uh, problem actually but uh, what uh, it allowed us to do it allowed us to uh, control how much will it uh, it is left there um, despite the actual uh, levels of the fuel so we could manipulate that we could change that in any circumstances even if it was uh, empty uh, we could set that it is full and if it is full we could say it is empty so absolutely free manipulations uh, so what is the potential impact of uh, such access um, as I said the fuel level manipulation and as a result the physical asset theft because uh, knowing that this vulnerability is uh, there someone can especially the insiders um, can steal the fuel and set the level to normal so they can steal for example 100 liters of fuel and said that there is still those 100 liters in place um, as a result it can impact the financial situation of this company and uh, in some circumstances the um, reputation impact um, what were the problems or violations uh, that client had done uh, and uh, which are allowed us to run this uh, attack first of all the templated credentials um, because the password was guessed from the 10th attempt and um, we could do that just knowing the company name and the number of the month uh, the second violation is of course the publicly uh, accessible or publicly available uh, critical solution which was not protected by any serious security solutions uh, then the lack of uh, visibility why uh, what is that so there were absolutely no logs regarding who accessing that system uh, not in the system itself not on the network equipment um, that was in front of, of that system and of course uh, as there were no log gathering especially centralized log gathering uh, there uh, there is a lack of security monitoring so no one can monitor for the network activity who connects there uh, whether only allowed people are connecting there 
And of course, uh, the one that is not listed here, uh, the broken business process. Um, what is that? Um, someone from the physical operations, or I don't know how to call that, uh, asked the IT to open access uh, to those critical systems to the internet, or not the internet, but for a few uh, sets of people, but through the internet. And they just opened it and left that. Uh, it was for um, to ease one of the processes. We asked the client, then we investigated who done that and what. Um, so it was done just to make something easier, but it disclosed a lot of uh, opened actually a lot of vulnerabilities to the public. Um, so what are the countermeasures to prevent such situation? Uh, first of all, uh, of course, is the process itself. So uh, with the proper process, uh, anyone just can't open ports to internal, especially critical systems when it is not required and not verified and not passed through the network and security architects or analysts. Um, then, of course, client lacked the regular perimeter um, scanning process, especially um, not only for the central locations, but also for all the locations that client has um, across his business area. Because if they had that process, they would definitely identify uh, that those critical resources are available for everyone. Uh, then, of course, the perimeter assessment. Uh, once in a while, uh, all the companies have to take all their configs, uh, their policies, which uh, controlling who and where can access uh, from internal to outside and from outside to the company uh, and review them uh, by the third party or the, by the partnered company or someone like that. Because uh, with the so-called fresh uh, eye looking, they can identify a lot of problems, they can ask a lot of questions which can disclose vulnerabilities and will help um, close them. Of course, pen testing, because during pen testing, all those activities are done and proper recommendations um, are given to the client. Uh, so they will close them or think at least how to close them or optimize that process or make it uh, more secure. And of course, internal process review, because it's very bad approach when uh, the main business process opens a vulnerabilities uh, and then the main business process suffers from them. Um, so that was the second uh, example of bad perimeter. Moving on to the third one. And uh, the manufacturing company. So uh, we made a project together with this company, which was a security assessment of their IT and security environment. Uh, so one of the questions that I typically ask for the client is when did you suffer from the security breach for last time? And client said that it was uh, with the previous IT and security team more than seven years ago. Uh, and they have a perfect security and everything is configured well, so nothing to look at in this place. Then we started the project itself. And we identified that client has a lot of vulnerable uh, applications available uh, on their perimeter, available to the internet, to everyone actually. Uh, looking a little deeper, uh, a lot of those vulnerabilities had public exploits. Uh, they could even be searched on the GitHub, and some of them had CVSS score 10. So it means that uh, everyone can access it and do everything uh, in that application without any uh, limitations. Then uh, we identified, again, using the OSINT and external servers, which were located on the third party uh, hosting. Um, they had a few VPS servers there um, 
and a lot of clients resources such as uh, sites marketing sites especially landing pages and so on were located on those servers and no one knew about those servers uh, except for the marketing uh, department who were just uploading the new uh, pages there uh, and uh, no one in the IT and security knew about those servers. Of course, uh, they were also very, very vulnerable because last update uh, that was installed on those servers, um, it was five years old. It's uh, absolutely bad approach. Uh, modern days when uh, you have to, sometimes you have to install the patch in a few hours hour after it comes or even a few hours before it comes to the public. Um, so what was the potential impact? Uh, the most interesting part. Uh, as I said, client had a few critical security um, vulnerabilities and those vulnerabilities were on their critical security devices. So exploiting those vulnerabilities, the attackers could gain access to all of their internal infrastructure because the solution that contained that vulnerabilities, it was the solution that was protecting their internal perimeter from the outside internet. Uh, so full infrastructure compromise, <laughs> uh, that's it. Uh, what were the violations uh, that client had in um, their environment? Uh, first of all, they used the obsolete software. Some of them was end of support, some of them was even uh, end of life. Uh, the second major problem, uh, lack of visibility, because no one scanned their perimeter, uh, no one analyzed the results, which is typically conducted after the scan, and no one spotted those uh, vulnerabilities. Of course, uh, um, no one just thought that uh, something vulnerable or old or obsolete that uh, doesn't have any uh, updates for uh, such a long time will have so much vulnerabilities. They just done uh, another work. Um, and of course, they didn't uh, purchase or uh, obtained any security related uh, projects such as assessment or pen testing for any parts of uh, their environment. So that's how they stayed uh, so vulnerable for so long time. And we can't even imagine why they weren't uh, compromised by any of uh, attacker groups. So uh, what are the countermeasures have to be done to prevent such situations in a typical corporate environment? Uh, first of all, of course, the security assessment. So someone must look to your perimeter, to your uh, perimeter's configuration, analyze it and give the recommendations. Of course, uh, the pen test will include that and uh, the pen test also will give a lot of uh, insights uh, regarding how to fix it, uh, where are the problems and so on and so on. Now let's look uh, at MCRA on the next slide. It's the Microsoft's cyber reference architecture. And we can see uh, in these two uh, red squares, um, the part of uh, typical physical uh, perimeter of the organization. It's the firewalls, um, application firewalls, IPS, and so on. It's uh, like old fashioned uh, corporate perimeter, which protects the internal environment from the outside. But as Mitri said, um, modern security perimeter is much bigger and almost all of these solutions uh, are touching the modern security perimeter. Now let's move to the next slide and look at the typical threats that are coming through the corporate perimeter uh, nowadays. Uh, the first and most well-known and widely used is of course emails uh, with phishing, with the malicious attachments, uh, malicious URLs and so on and so on, and the internet usage of the users. Mm. 
what threats can uh, can uh, cross uh, the perimeter through those uh, attack vectors? Of course, it's uh, attachments, it uh, links uh, to malicious software. Uh, is the malicious software um, itself? Uh, it's uh, the back doors that can be uh, pushed through the, that vector. And then uh, that malicious code, um, it is run on the endpoint. So the second thread, the major thread, is the endpoint uh, because all the software is typically run, run from there. Um, and the endpoints is very valuable thread uh, on the um, kill chain because you can gather uh, credentials, uh, corporate software, corporate uh, uh, access, and so on and so on. Then we are moving to the identities. As I said, identity can be uh, gathered on the endpoint and used to access not only resources that are available from that uh, endpoint, but also some of the cloud web um, applications or the client's web applications, not the cloud applications, um, a lot of resources. And of course, uh, nowadays there are a lot of business-to-business uh, -business applications. Um, that use the same credentials, corporate credentials, to access them. Um, so the identity threats is, is the third major vector. Uh, then we are moving to the public facing applications. Um, typically attackers try to scan them, uh, find the vulnerabilities and get to internal perimeter. Um, and also from the opposite way, yeah, when the user works with the cloud applications or cloud services uh, like file storages and so on, um, attackers can put something on their endpoint or uh, if it is inside your uh, user, he can upload some data to, to those services. So what can we do with all of these typical threats, uh, typical perimeter and uh, cross perimeter threats? On the next slide, we can see a few of uh, typical and uh, sometimes we say that they are best in class and uh, these uh, testing of these solutions uh, confirm that they really are. So uh, how to protect uh, the first um, at threat attack vector, which is um, mail and internet. It's of course Defender for Office 365, which analyzes uh, the mail, uh, all the attachments, uh, all the reputations, and so on. And uh, it also allows to create a policy that will prevent users from accessing the malicious uh, resources, malicious sites, and uh, downloading malicious software. Then uh, the endpoints. If something happens and um, malicious code uh, passing through the first um, uh, stage, through the Defender for Office 365, it can be identified on the endpoint uh, with the Defender for endpoints. It's more complex solution. Uh, it analyzes everything that happens on the endpoint, all the code that is run there, all, all the behavior of uh, all the components on, on the system, and tries to identify and identifies all those threads, with, sometimes even with the help of uh, uh, cloud deployed uh, artificial uh, intelligence algorithms. Um, then um, the identity. Uh, because identity attacks uh, can go directly to the publicly available resources, uh, the Defender for Endpoint can identify them because it gathers and analyzes signals from all of the systems where the identity is used. And for example, if someone starts the brute force attack, uh, the Defender for Identity will uh, identify that and block that source. And uh, if something like a typical activity, uh, something like uh, trying to sign, uh, sign in from a new device from new country or non-typical country, the Defender for Endpoint can be configured uh, for identity can be configured to ask the second factor to confirm that this is our uh, user, uh, this is legitimate user and uh, stop the attackers if they are trying to breach this through this vector. Then moving to the application protection, uh, 
um, there is a solution called MCAS uh, or Defender for Cloud Apps. Um, it can analyze the outgoing traffic um, from the endpoints and where the user works to the public available uh, cloud applications such as uh, Dropbox, OneDrive and thousands of thousands of those applications. And uh, the policies can be created. Uh, they can be out of the box. They can be manually um, configured to prevent, for example, uh, insider threat uh, data exfiltrations and um, other threats. And um, in the opposite way, when this solution protects your internal applications, uh, for example, it can stop the attackers from exploiting the vulnerabilities um, in your application, from trying to download something uh, from your applications. For example, if you uh, made um, a problem or a business logic fault and uh, attackers can download uh, more files than it was planned for the system, the Defender for uh, Cloud Apps can prevent that uh, because of its internal uh, rule set. And of course, on top of uh, all these solutions, there's a Microsoft Sentinel, which gathers signals from all of those systems, uh, correlates them and uh, give clients security team um, the insights and the recommendations what to do what can uh, what was happening what attackers can could potentially do inside your infrastructure and sometimes what should be modified uh, in your infrastructure uh, now a few words regarding the how to improve properly implement those solutions and what projects to do before implementing them, uh, Dmitry will tell. Passing to your word. Thanks. Thank you, Kostya. Yeah, so uh, we are pretty sure that proper uh, approach uh, on how company security perimeter should be protected it looks like uh, these five simple steps. First uh, of all, and uh, that's pretty obvious, that you should uh, conduct security assessment. Why you actually need it? Uh, because uh, you need to clearly understand where uh, you currently are, which uh, systems and uh, solutions do you have in place, if uh, they are properly configured, so you need to clearly understand if your current security posture, security level is enough uh, and in line with your business need, needs, uh, with your uh, third party uh, requirements uh, and maybe your partner's requirements. So you need clearly understand that. Um, to have that uh, understands, uh, the best way is to conduct security assessment on all components uh, which your IT uh, landscape consists of. For sure, it, it, it should be identity uh, protection review, it should be the cloud and on-premises uh, systems and solutions. Um, shadow IT is very important because it's a kind of component of your IT environment, which company itself might not be aware at all. That's why controlling uh, shadow IT and uh, having visibility on it is, is very important for, for, for the company. After uh, such assessment uh, is done, uh, company will get a report which will definitely contain recommendations on how system uh, are protected. If some improvements uh, should be done or could be done, if uh, configuration changes or uh, maybe some other uh, hardening um, uh, approach can, can be applied. And the next step, uh, which is uh, mentioned in here, is hardening. So all, all those recommendations uh, should be applied to your, um, your environment. You should configure NFA and conditional access, as uh, Constantine already told, you should review and, uh, and and uh, improve, uh, fine tune your uh, firewall uh, configurations and etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. Sometimes a uh, company might have additional recommendations on how their uh, system should be hardened, which might come from uh, such uh, different regulations. Uh, it might be industry regulations or uh, 
some reg uh, regional re regulations like European Union, for, uh, for example, or United States, they have uh, some some specific regulations uh, in their environment. It might it might go from from um, some specific uh, kinds of regulations like GDPR and etc uh, etc. Et also, sometimes uh, partners they might have their specific uh, requirements that should be met uh, with within company. So uh, each company should con consider all these requirements and should apply proper configurations, proper fine tunings to meet all of them, or at least those of them which are relevant to any specific company. The next step is operations enhancement. Why is it important? It's important because uh, security is not one one time um, project. It's its process, and uh, in order company to to be uh, safe, be secure with time, it should act in 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 proper way. Uh, operations of each company should uh, consider their need, should consider their uh, um, configurations and fine tunings uh, that have been done, and uh, should act in the, in in the same way. Uh, so if company, for example, has some specific system like a web application firewall, it should be fine tuned uh, all the time uh, in order to meet and handle the latest uh, possible web uh, attacks. If company installs some new system, it should be properly connected to, to existing security systems and security controls. Uh, all, of the, all of that and uh, also KPI re review uh, for operations team uh, because uh, KPI should uh, motivate uh, existing security team to to act in a proper way. So after all these operations, uh, they are reviewed and recommendations or uh, um, enhancements, they are done. Um, the next step uh, is monitoring because uh, any security uh, is valuable only in case if uh, someone cares about it on a regular basis. If a company has uh, security solutions and systems in place, but no nobody uh, review what's happening inside of such, such systems, most probably such company will, will be breached. Um, in order to get uh, proper monitoring in place, uh, first of all, as Kostya already told, uh, SIM solutions should be installed and properly configured. This means that all log sources should be connected uh, to SIM system. Uh, lots of uh, analytical or correlation rules should be configured and properly fine-tuned in order not to uh, generate lots of uh, false positives. Uh, and definitely, there is, uh, it should be somebody in place to monitor uh, all, all this stuff. Uh, what we recommend uh, from from, uh, from our side is uh, to have a 24 by 7 monitoring, because only in such case a possible incident it could be detected in time. Uh, in the, uh, on the very beginning time, when the impact uh, from from such incident is uh, is the lowest as possible, or it might not be exist at all at the, at that level. Uh, if incident is detected on early stage, it can be properly handled it uh, and uh, prevented uh, sometimes uh, by by secu security team by SOC team, and uh, it will not. Uh, um, have lots of impact on, on, on corporate assets, on corporate business processes and uh, other import, important uh, uh, parts of co company itself. Um, after all this in place, after security assessment done, hardening uh, also done, operations uh, improved and uh, they meet uh, business needs after monitoring in place and everything works, uh, what we recommend is to conduct penetration testing. We uh, recommend, recommend to conduct it uh, with uh, some periodicity. Um, usually it, it might be conducted, it should be conducted not uh, um, not latest that uh, annually, but sometimes for some applications it might be done much more often. 
And uh, penetration testing itself, uh, it's a kind of emulation of uh, adversary actions. Uh, so this penetration will uh, allow uh, penetration testing will allow to ensure that company uh, is properly secured uh, their applications or uh, assets. Uh, they uh, are they do not have uh, vulnerabilities or uh, security controls. They are in place uh, to to prevent incident and company breach itself. Uh, penetration testing might be conducted for for different uh, types of. Uh, corporate assets like uh, web applications, like um, infrastructure, like um, users, uh, if we talk about uh, phishing attacks, etc. And the uh, uh, idea of penetration testing is uh, to, to perform real actions uh, that attacker will, will, will do and to see if company is protected, uh, if security team uh, is capable to detect and properly respond on uh, actions of a uh, penetration tester and in overall to to understand if uh, high, how company is how company and a uh, company environment is uh, resilient for possible attempts to 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 breach uh, it uh, assets or its environment actually that's all we plan to, to tell you today about uh, if, if you have any questions uh, you are welcome to ask them and we will we would be glad to answer them from our side thank you guys for your presentation that was great as usual uh, and we have a couple of questions in Q&A section the first one is uh, in your experience, what are some of the most effective strategies for promoting a culture of security awareness um, among employees? And how can, can organizations ensure that their security policies are being followed? Dima, perhaps you have something to say about it? Yeah, sure. Uh, so actually for uh, if we talk about employees itself uh, there are lots of uh, solutions uh, which are provided as separate solutions or as a service that uh, allow to uh, evaluate uh, security awareness level uh, of uh, each employer in company usually such solutions uh, they are uh, built as uh, as a kind of the game and uh, people can answer the questions, they can do proper actions uh, like uh, detect and uh, report about phishing email detected. Uh, so they, they um, get some um, points uh, within this game and uh, this motivates people to, to, to take care, to, uh, to act in line with corporate policies, uh, to act in line is, is uh, procedures. Uh, and to, uh, to to meet what company uh, expect uh, from from such users uh, in in situation like that, I believe that uh, having such um, such service in place allow uh, quite quite uh, good assess uh, com co corporate uh, or not corporate but but uh, employees uh, awareness level. And uh, if if not, uh, reports uh, will show uh, that some some users uh, are missing uh, or are are not acting uh, in expected way. Um, usually, this report it it contains very um, extended analytics, and it show by by different uh, teams by different uh, types of uh, uh, threats uh, how how ev everyone acts and how how. Uh, they are um, efficient. They are efficient. In kind, uh, in case uh, there are lack of uh, some actions, proper actions from from team itself, uh, sometimes security solutions can be um, can be uh, enforced uh, to act in more strict way. For example, if company uh, sees that the users miss uh, some phishing emails or click uh, on on links from from such emails. Uh, adding additional uh, control on e e email gateway or having additional control on web uh, traffic like web inspection it might prevent uh, users 
from from acting uh, in, in in such way. But uh, as uh, usually uh, recommended, security it should be combination of technical uh, capabilities and technical solutions from from wide perspective, and user awareness and proper actions from from user side uh, in another way. Only if this combination uh, is fine tuned, uh, the result expected results could 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 be achieved uh, within compact. Yeah, I will add a few words regarding that <clears throat> because uh, security policies are not always violated only by the corporate users, but sometimes they are ignored by the uh, application managers. For example, the company develops its own in-house application and um, the manager or the owner of that application um, just ignores the security requirements and uh, the security policies of the company because he says that application is good enough uh, to be tolerant to the attacks. So in these scenarios, what can be done? What was uh, a few times in our experience? Uh, so we had a pen test with the, one of the clients. They were selling some goodies and uh, when we could find the breach in the application of that uh, client and we could show that we can use a money from uh, the card of that application manager uh, then he became our best friend so all the further uh, security projects were done with his deep involvement so that's also uh, the good approach how to show to your colleagues, to those who are developing applications, for example, to the employees, uh, that security is not always your enemy, but it's uh, your friend because it saves money. That's all from my side. Okay, thank you. And we have the next question. <laughs> uh, what is your take on the current AI capabilities to automate protection from cyber threats and exclude the human factor risk? Uh, or do you see AI powered fraud uh, as more or threat uh, itself? I would say that uh, AI technologies, yeah, um, mm -hmm. AI technologies, they are pretty uh, long time uh, are uh, as part of uh, security solutions. For example, if uh, we tell, uh, if we mention a uh, SIM solution like Azure Sentinel, which uh, we mentioned uh, today, uh, it, it has quite a uh, good um, AI and uh, big data and uh, uh, ML um, um, capabilities, which allow to detect those threats uh, which are uh, are not possible to, to, to detect with uh, common uh, rule sets and co com common uh, analytical rules, for example. So having all these uh, technologies in place, it, it, uh, they allow to, to see deviations from normal behavior of, of, of the system, normal behavior of users, and to detect those threats uh, that are uh, hidden uh, from, from, uh, from uh, just common, common view. Um, usually such approach, uh, maybe a stock analyst or security analyst, they uh, should have experience to be capable to investigate such such um, such alerts or uh, such indicators uh, of compromise. Uh, however, uh, they are very valuable and they allow to, to, to detect uh, lots of uh, important things. Uh, if we talk about uh, attacks, uh, attacks uh, that are uh, that use AI uh, capabilities, uh, it's it's possible. Uh, however, um, nowadays what we see is that uh, most of um, AI technologies uh, they they use it on 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 very um, I would say uh, initial phase. Uh, for example, when uh, some phishing emails, uh, they are written, uh, so mm. they are written with high quality. Uh, however, uh, it's, it's not the, the, the case of uh, advanced uh, threat persistent incidents uh, that are uh, enforced with, uh, with AI technologies.
question. Do you have something to add? I just want to add that uh, in the security, all the new technologies are typically utilized by both sides. So it's the defenders and it's the attackers. So it's uh, absolute normal uh, things that both the attackers and both the defenders are utilizing the same technologies. But uh, defenders uh, and especially big players such as uh, Microsoft and others started using those technologies uh, much earlier because they had just more money to invest in them and to use them in uh, their projects. And those products that were on our examples are heavily uh, stuffed with those AI and the ML technologies, actually, uh, especially the Sentinel, the high level, of the, the the on top uh, application, the Defender for Endpoint, uh, something like only 50% of um, its algorithms and uh, technologies are not the AI and the ML. So they are already heavily used. Regarding the attackers, yeah, we see that the malware is crafted uh, with the help of uh, AI to bypass the currently existing systems. Uh, uh, it can be used to trick users, to interact with users, and so on and so on. So as I said, uh, it will be more and more utilized by uh, both sides, the defenders and attackers. And uh, we have to be ready for this and also uh, use it uh, to protect the environment. That's it. Thank you, Kostya. Thank you guys for your answers. Um, so uh, the webinar is coming to an end. Uh, by the way, we will share the recording and presentation materials uh, most likely during a week. Thank you for your attention. See you on our upcoming events. Yeah, thanks a lot. See ya. Bye bye. Thank you, Brian.